Welcome to an entry in our exclusive Three Steps to Gladiator series. We built these guides from the ground up to help players go from zero to Gladiator, even on a spec that they've never played before. Step 1 covers building your character and is essentially everything you need to get started once you hit level 120 on your class of choice. Step 2 builds upon that by preparing you for two of the most important skills to have in Arena. Finally, Step 3 walks you through how to get the best results when entering the Arena. Now, we're excited to announce that throughout December, we'll be bringing you daily releases on the second step in this series for all of the specs that you see on screen right now. So, if you're looking to kickstart your climb to Gladiator on any of these popular specs, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to be notified the moment your guide goes live. And head on over to skillcap.com slash wow if you're interested in checking out the rest of the series along with hundreds of other exclusive BFA guides. Alright, let's get into today's Step 2 release. Enjoy! Hello all, Joe Fernandez here for the second of three steps to Gladiator as an Enhancement Shaman. This second step is about preparing for PvP, which involves knowing how to deal maximum damage in arena games, as well as making the most of your crowd control. Firstly, it's important to know your damage rotations, both passively and for burst, as this will lead to having as much damage as possible during suitable times in Arena. Enhancement Shamans rely on burst damage win condition, so it's vital that you know the difference between the two and pull them off properly in games in order to win. So before we move on to burst rotation, it's still important you know your normal rotation. This looks something like this. Number 1. Press Storm Strike on cooldown. Number 2. Use Rock by Error if at 2 charges. Number 3. Maintain Flame Tongue buff. Number 4, maintain Frostband buff if Hailstorm or needing the range slow. Number 5, Lava Lash as a filler when you have between 60 to 70 Maelstrom. And finally, number 6, Rock Biter off cooldown. Now, this is quite basic, with the only major change being to keep a charge of Rock Biter. This is so you can use it in emergency cases where you need additional Maelstrom for your healing surges to become instant casts. It can also be useful to use when fishing for boulder fist procs when playing with that talent in order to deal increased damage. When it comes to your burst rotation, this is where you'll be using your Feral Spirit, Heroism or Bloodlust, or even Ascendance in order to deal magnificent damage to enemy targets. Your rotation will be number 1, Rock Biter, number 2, Feral Spirit, number 3, Flame Tongue, number 4, Frostbrand. Number 5, Heroism or Bloodlust. Number 6, Ascendance. Number 7, Stormstrike. And number 8, Lava Lashes Filler. It's important to note that you want to ideally split your Heroism and Ascendance cooldowns as enemy teams will most likely look to peel or use defensive cooldowns during these times. So splitting them up will make it more difficult for teams to deal with and you could potentially find a scenario where they don't have a defensive cooldown for one of these big offensive cooldowns allowing you to slay your enemy. Ascendance can also be used differently as it has a much bigger bang essentially as well as being able to go through armor and become a ranged attack. So you could use this simply when unable to hit a target that you want to burst. In this example a Windwalker monk is running away from me. As I know he will avoid my melee range for quite a while and is low on health, I pop Ascendance in an attempt to kill him. We force Spirit Link so I kill it quickly and can still finish off the Windwalker due to the power of Ascendance Burst. You could even simply activate it if your enemy target is low and you land a Wind Shield on the enemy healer. Extra crowd control would be nice but this could be big enough to force defensive cooldowns. Here against the Shadow Priest, he has no Dispatcher for a while and Iron Bark is about to fade. So I want to use my Shears offensively and Ascendance to create a ton of pressure. I Shear the Druid which allows me to pop Ascendance and slay the Shadow Priest. I even drink it very aggressively in order to have full up time with my Ascendance, creating immense pressure. Shortly after, I land another Wind Shear on the Druid, whilst the Shadow Priest is within certain death range, allowing me to grab the kill. A big crowd control ability you want to be careful of during Ascendance is Disarm. Disarm is a very powerful defensive tool against Enhanced Shamans and is often used during your offensive cooldowns. Ideally, you want to have Ascendance without Disarm ready, or if so, make sure you have Trinket in order to break the Disarm. Now, you may be wondering why Sundering hasn't come to the equation yet when talking about bursting your opponent down. It does a ton of damage, so why isn't it in your burst rotation? 
Well, this is because Sundering has a great utility effect, which incapacitates enemies for a couple of seconds. This is much more beneficial for an Enhancement Shaman, as it can be used for utility and crowd control. Against Warlocks, you can shut down a lot of their devastating casts, such as Fear or Chaos Bolt. Here, I interrupt a Chaos Bolt with Sundering. Then I interrupt the next cast with a Wind Shear. As you can see, this is incredibly disruptive and reduces their pressure immensely. You can essentially use it as another interrupt, stopping casts even through Aura Mastery, making it highly valuable during Divide Favor or Unending Resolve. You could also use this yourself with a Cap Stun, simply putting down the Cap Stun and then sundering enemy targets close by, ensuring the Cap Stun which will usually land on the targets. Here is an example of this. I put the Cap Stun close to the targeted Shadow Priest. Then my next global is to Sundering them, making the Priest unable to kill the Cap Totem, ensuring it lands. Due to the Sundering burst and additional damage, we are able to force Spirit Link overlapped with Fade, which will help drastically towards getting a kill later. You'll mainly prioritise Sundering for crowd control reasons, however if your target is low during your burst cooldowns or in general, and you feel like a Sundering would warrant a defensive cooldown or could grab a kill, you should go for it in these situations. As you can see, the mage is incredibly low on HP with the Holy Paladin needing to cast a heal to get him topped. So I use my Sundering in an attempt to kill, which forces out his Cauterize, as well as the Ice Block. So in this situation, this was a perfect usage of Sundering for a kill, forcing big defensive cooldowns with Sundering alone, meaning they will now have to survive my next defensive setup without Cauterize, Ice Block, or Divine Shield. Now that we've covered Sundering, we can talk about Crash Lightning. Crash Lightning is another important part to your rotation for both burst and normal damage, as it can increase your cleave and single target damage by quite a margin. You'll simply make this a priority when there are two or more targets in melee range and use it to maintain the buff it provides. It will increase your Storm Strike damage depending on the amount of enemies that are hit by the Crash Lightning, as well as additional Storm Strike and Lava Lash damage cleaving to all targets in front of you. So the only time you won't be using this is during pure single target DPS with only one target nearby, or if you don't want to break crowd control nearby, such as Polymorph or Paralysis. Enhanced Shaman has quite a few simple yet effective crowd control abilities that can be used in a number of ways. Those crowd control abilities are Hex, Capacitor Totem, and Wind Shear. Hex will be your only form of casted crowd control which can be very versatile when used. Notably, during offensive goes, the best way to make use of this is during a cap stun or any other stun on the enemy healer, then casting a hex onto them, which can be very powerful if there is no DPS with a D curse on their team. Other times you could afford to try sneaking a hex against unsuspecting teams, but this will probably not work often against high caliber teams. You could use this if you can get away with it, in order to land hexes more often and generate more pressure. Landing a Hex on the healer and using offensive cooldowns can cause major defensive cooldowns or defensive play from the opposition in order to live, allowing you to play offensive as well. Against a Shaman, I go for a grounding into a Hex, which notably may not work all the time against very top rest of Shamans. During this, my healer also lands a Hodge, preventing the Shaman from being able to escape, which ensures my Hex to land on the Shaman, although it is heavily overlapped. However, since the Shaman has no Trinket and the lock is low, we're able to generate a ton of pressure regardless during the Hex, procking the Warlock Safeguard. When playing with the rest of Druids yourself, you can use Hex and Cyclone at the same time in order to bait interrupts from the enemy team whilst one of them goes off. In general, it can be used against casters to bait interrupts away from any healer you play with, which will allow your healer to free cast and keep you alive. This will stop some of your actions during the spell log, but it will usually be more beneficial for your team if you get spell locked provided your healer will be able to free cast. Against the Shaman Shadow play, I would often go for Wind Shears into Hex on Shamans, or try to Hex freely in order to bait interrupts. As I go for a Hex, I get Wind Sheared, and the Warlock overlaps his spell lock on me too. This means my healer only has to deal with Silence as an interrupt, otherwise he can free cast and easily outheal passive pressure. Be careful during big offensive goes, for the enemy team though, as you won't be able to use Astral Shift, Wind Shear, Grounding Totem or Healing Surge whilst in a lockout, making you vulnerable if your healer is in crowd control as well. As briefly mentioned earlier, the best way to use Capacitor Totem is to use it on top of targets close by, then use Sundering so they are unable to hit the Cap Totem unless they have very quick reactions. Against an Iron Pally, 
It's critical to stop as much pressure as possible here as an enhancement shaman. Here, I go for a capstone on the Rogan Mage, but fortunately, the Paladin runs in as well. Since they are all in front of me, I can land a triple sundering during my cap totem's cast time. This ensures my cap sun to land in most cases, however the rogue was unaffected by sundering as he had evasion up. Although, luckily for me, the rogue didn't kill the cap totem off in time, which meant I landed a triple stun on the entire team, stopping their pressure and allowing us to counter pressure. If being extra careful, you can announce this combo to your team so they don't break sundering, making enemy targets unable to break cap stun. Another way to make use of this is by using Earthbind on enemy healers into a cap totem. This will be good against all healers as you will either hit them if they are slow to react, or you can at least use a mid cast which can disrupt their cast in order to kite away from the cap totem. This will also be especially good with a Mistweaver or Windwalker so they can use paralysis on healers into a cap totem, ensuring it lands with the enemy healer being unable to kill the totem or run out of its radius. This will help gain offensive momentum as the enemy healer will be in quite a chunk of crowd control which could be used to hex out of, but bear in mind it will be half due to being on the same DR as Paralysis. Capacitor Totem is a fairly weak cooldown itself as you have to use it on previously mentioned actions in order to make good use of it. Good teams will simply kill the totem instantly if used randomly or without some kind of protection, so be wary of that against teams and practice communicating your cat totem usage so that you can ensure it lands properly on enemy targets. Wind Shear is just the Enhancement Shaman's version of an interrupt, although being on a 12 second cooldown with a 30 yard range means that it's important to use it well, which is in a form of crowd control against certain casting spells. The way in which you use it against other classes can differ, so we'll go over some of the clever uses of it outside of the ordinary way in which we use this interrupt to stop damage or crowd control abilities. For instance, against Holy Paladins, it can be crucial to use when anticipating a Divide Favor free cast. When you see Divide Favor, if you purge it off before the cast ends, then you can instantly shear the cast, denying a big heal. The Paladin uses Divide Favor here, but has two buffs up, giving me a 50 50 chance of purging off Divide Favor. Luckily for me, he doesn't have a fast cast for his Holy Light. I purge his Concentrated Flame, so I go for another purge in order to get Divide Favor off. I get the Divide Favor just in time allowing me to win share his cast, deny healing on the warrior whilst he's low on HP. Now we can talk about the usage of win share in general terms. This can be quite situational or even comp dependent in the way you use it. When playing defensive comps, you will most likely use it on interrupting crowd control or stopping big damaging spells to reduce pressure. An example can be against the rogue mage where you will need to stop crowd control in order to live their offensive goes and prolong the game. In offensive goes or when playing aggressive comps, you'll want to save it for healers in order to interrupt their burst healing or start a crowd control chain on them in order to lead to a more likely kill. This is incredibly useful when you or your team have offensive cooldowns and crowd control for the enemy healer in order to make an aggressive go, most likely forcing big defensive cooldowns or grabbing kills. In this example, as we're DPS in the Shadow Priest passively, we get to a point where he's relatively low on health before an offensive go, as well as having no dispersion, no earthen wall totem, and no fade for a few seconds. You can also see that my team is doing well defensively and there are no devastating offensive cooldowns ready for the opposition, so in this situation I want to play offensive so I will save my shear for the healer. I then land my windshield on the shaman and with some stormbringer proc burst I am able to crush the shadow priest. Here is an example when to use a defensive wind shear. So against the Destro Lock, Infernal is known to allow Warlocks deal devastatingly huge damage with their Chaos Bolts, so it's to be avoided as much as possible. So when I think he will get a Chaos Bolt off, I then eventually use my Wind Shear on the cast after using a Sundering on one cast too. Note that ideally you should use your Wind Shear first before using a Sundering, as it's better to use your low cooldown interrupt first so that you have more interrupts overall in a game. To summarize, when using wind shear, it's important to watch the pace of the game and change it up when you need to. Throughout a game, you will most likely use it both defensively and offensively no matter what comp you play. Some comps may require more defensive usage of it or offensive usage, depending on how you are most likely going to win your matchup. Using it appropriately with the examples mentioned before will lead to more success for you and your team. So be smart with it and try not to let it go to waste. And that's step 2 of 3 steps to gladiate it as an enhancement shaman. Make sure to check out the third and final step of this guide when it comes out and feel free to ask any questions down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.